tourism, which is uh, the issue of electricity, right? Because when electricity came in, as we talked about last week, there's, there was very big questions about what it constitutes and what it means for you know our our functioning on Shabbat. We mentioned all these things already. Uh, we have to talk a lot more about these things, right? We said that what that basically there was a dispute between the, the authorities, between the rabbis, and also between the scientists and electricians what electricity really is. So as we said, right, that in the end, really, the conclusion was, more or less, that electricity is not fire. It's not fire, right? And uh, therefore, there is really no basis to say that electricity, you know, as, uh, is, is forbidden from the Torah. Because the, the Torah never spoke about electricity. The Torah talked about fires, right? What is the nature of a fire? A fire means that there's a flame burning, you know, there's a flame, or you have a coal also, sometimes a coal, by the way. A coal can be on fire, but you don't really see a flame. The flame is inside, you know? So really, with a coal, sometimes you don't see the flame outside. But that's also a flame. It's energy. Yeah, it's, it's a fire, it's, it's burning, you know? So the nature of fire is basically what? That, as we mentioned already, you know, that the fire means that you need something to be burning. When something is burning, that means it's being consumed. So what does that mean? That when something is being consumed, you need what? You, what what, what uh, element do you need to, 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 to make a fire? You need oxygen, right? Without oxygen, you can't start a fire. That's the way it is. That's the nature of fire, right? So what does that mean? That a place where there is no oxygen, there's also no fire. There's no, no such a thing like that. No, no such an animal like this, right? So a person has to understand these things, right? Then also we, we spoke about that another element, which is that all the uh, concepts of Shabbat, the forbidden labors, how many forbidden labors are there? 39 altogether, right? Those are forbidden labors that a person is not allowed to do on Shabbat. Now most of these labors, by the way, we don't really do on a daily basis anyway, right? We're talking about farming, right? All kinds of things, you know, in the, in the ground. These kinds of things, today, most people are not really dealing with, with so much. But electricity, we're dealing with, like, you know, on a, on a daily basis, minute by minute, hour by hour, right? Always we're using stuff, all these, you know, contraptions that we have, the tablets and the phones and, you know, the, this thing and that, that, and now cars are also electric. And a lot of electricity going on in this world, right? Without electricity, by the way, in this world, you can't survive anymore. It's a crucial element of life, which is, life cannot go on without that. Right? If, if there was no electricity, by the way, power outage, people would die from that. You know that, right? Because, yeah. So in the hospital on Shabbat, they bring you the uh, yeah. candles, the electric candles. What, to light them? Yeah, the electric candles. Okay. Instead of having a burning candle, you can't have that in the hospital. So right. Some, some hospitals allow it. Some hospitals don't allow it. You're right. Yeah, yes, yes, so true. The yeah. brings the electric one. Yes, you can do that, by the way. You can, you know, the rule is that in a place where they don't allow you to light electric, uh, I'm sorry, regular candles. So you are allowed to use electric candles and light them, and you make a bracha also, right? Also. Are we just using the light of the candle? Is that what we're looking for, or the heat itself? We don't really need the heat, right? The rabbis were not, they didn't really care about heat. What they cared about is that you have light on Shabbat. That's what they really wanted. For the light. Right, for the light, sure. So the, since the purpose of the light is being fulfilled by any kind of light, whether it's fluorescent or incandescent or whatever it is, so therefore all these things can be used also to light on Shabbat when you don't have a candle. You know, and this is what happens, by the way, when you go to, when you go to a hotel, right, and they don't allow you to light candles over there. The fire alarm will go off, right, there's alarms there, there's fire detectors, this and that, all this. So therefore, the only thing you can really do in a hotel is either to light in your room electricity, or to go in the dining room, where they will let you sometimes light candles. You know, places which are like Jewish-friendly hotels, right. right, things like this, right, or religious hotels, you know, like in Israel, you have these religious places over there. So things like this, right, we're talking about, but in general, though, the rule is that if they don't let you light a real candle, so definitely you are allowed to write any kind of candle, any kind of light like this, whatever. And you, right, first you make the bracha, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kedishanu Ben Yitzotah Vetzivanu, Le'adik Ne'er, Shel Shabbat. And then you light it up, chuk, you know, switch it. And you did the mitzvah of lighting Shabbos candles, right? That's what it is, basically. That's the, uh, actually, this is this happens very often now, nowadays, right? And by the way, there are some poskim, there are some authorities who say that actually electricity is superior to the regular candles. For Shabbat. Why is that? Because it gives you much more light, right? Light two candles, you know, like regular candles, and try to live on that on Shabbat. You're gonna, you're gonna feel like, you know, in the dark, you know, like fell into a black hole, 
That's what you're going to feel like, you know? It's very primitive to live like that. Nobody wants to live like that anymore, right? So what do we see from there? That really the truth is that electricity, in a, in a sense, is superior to the, the, the old-style candles. That's what it is, you know, basically. But anyway, getting back to our, our topic, that's a different discussion, right? But getting back to our topic, as we said, right, that we learn all the forbidden labors from the Mishkan, from the, from the tabernacle, from the, uh, right, that holy place that we had, which was a portable uh, a temple, basically, right? Which was being set up and taken apart all the time. Every time they would move in the desert, the Jews, so they would take it apart and then put it up again next next place, next location. They were moving around a lot, right? There was, if you look in the, in the Torah, there was several, we're talking about like dozens of locations that they moved to. So each time, take it apart, again, put it up again, right? It was like a portable one. So this portable tabernacle, this t- portable temple that we had, which is called the Mishkan, all the activities that they did over there for the upkeep and the creation of that Mishkan, that's where we learn the forbidden labors from on Shabbat. That's our source, right? How do we know that, by the way? It doesn't say this in the Chumash. It says this in the, in the Talmud. We have a tradition regarding that, right? That that's the way we learn it. So therefore, if we're going to talk about fire, right? Every the litmus test of fire has to be what? That it has to resemble the fire that we had in the Mishkan, in, in the tabernacle. Otherwise, it's not called fire. Now, you're going to ask me a simple question, right? Very simple. Was there electricity in the Mishkan? The answer is absolutely no. There was no electricity there. Was there incandescent lights? No. Was there fluorescent lights? No. Was there LED lights? No. None of those things were there. Was there hot plates? No. Was there electric stoves? No. Was there uh, dishwashers? No. You know, all these things were not there. So what does that mean? The truth is that we have really no source from the Torah to say that electricity is forbidden. No such thing like that. Except that what? Actually, there was one right big rabbi. We spoke about him, by the way, also before in the in the Divrei Torah that we gave before, the Chazonish, right? The great Chazonish, right? Chazonish was a very holy man, very big posek, very big authority. He lived about he, he was he he, uh, he passed away about uh, sixty years ago. So uh, he was uh, a very great authority. And for him, this whole thing about electricity, he was very much against using it on Shabbat. He, he wanted to you know, abolish any kind of uh, trace of uh, you know, permission for this. He was very against it. He was very, it bothered him very much. You know? he was, it made him shake you know, to hear somebody, some rabbi was you know, actually uh, uh, you know, for, uh, permitting this on Shabbat. So because of that, he went out of his way to look for uh, ways, you know, to forbid this on Shabbat. All kinds of reasons he presented, all kinds of uh, claims. The main claim that the Chazonish presented was like this, right? He said that besides the issue of, you know, as we said, right, that there's the issue of sparks that come out from electricity. There are sparks there. We talked about this last week. We have to talk about that more at length. But the Chazonish wanted to say, besides the issue of sparks, there's also another issue with electricity, right? Which what can be actually, we have actually a source for that that is not allowed from the Torah. He wanted to present this claim. So what did he say? His claim was that basically when you, when you open the electricity, you're closing an electric circuit to make it function. That's the way it works, right? If you don't close it, it's not going to light. It's got to connect, you know? Got to make that connection so it can go around. Can make it make its rounds. <clears throat> so th- when you press that button and you light the electricity, you're basically closing an electric circuit. That's what you're doing. So what does that mean? What so he wants to say, right, the Chazanish, that this resembles the labor of what? Not of fire. Different different forbidden labor. Of building, right? Bonnet. What does that mean? That you're making now a new contraption over here, a new circuit. You're building a circuit. So therefore, the Chazanish wanted to say that the whole for, uh, the prohibition of, uh, of electricity also involves this labor, forbidden labor, which is actually from the Torah. Right. That's what the Chazanish wanted to say. So, interesting claim, right? The truth is that if you look inside the Chazanish, you're going to find over there that he doesn't say that for sure that's what it is. He says, if sure, it's possible that maybe that this is also pertinent. It applies also in our case. So he says... But because of this, right, the Chazonish was so respected, especially by the Ashkenazi Jews, especially the ones in Israel, 
the religious Jews in Israel, very much respected the Chazonish. They very much revered him, you know, his judgment, his brain power, his fear of God. Right? All you know, they consider him to be like a very big sage. High class, first rate, creme de la creme. So because of that, they were very concerned about his words, that maybe he's right. You know, that maybe they're actually using electricity involves building a circuit. And therefore, a lot of the rabbis, you know, according to his words, came out and told their communities that if you're using, using electricity on Shabbat, basically you're transgressing a Torah prohibition. This was the, uh, this was the, the claim. And by the way, until this day, you're going to get this idea. If you go to the place where the Chazonish lived, which was Bnei Brak, right? Uh, famous town in, in Israel. And also many areas surrounding there. And also you're going to find there in Jerusalem as well. A lot of people will tell you, especially Ashkenazim, they will tell you, ah, but the Chazonish said that you're building a circuit. So this is from the Torah electricity. Not allowed to do. That's what, that's what, that's what he, uh, that's, uh, that's what they claim. No, it talks about building something, right? Any kind of um, utensil, right? You're building something. In other words, you're taking scrap material and you're assembling it to make it into something cohesive, right? Something useful. That's what, that's what it means to build. So the Chazanish said, when you open that switch, you are building a circuit. That's what he said, the Chazanish. Right? And you're not allowed to do this on Shabbat. That's what, he, that's what he was claiming, right? But not only that, that he's claiming that it's from the Torah, this prohibition. It's not just rabbinical or whatever. So the truth is, right, that when, this, when the word got out about the Chazanish, what he said, the, uh, there were several rabbis who came out against this idea. Uh, probably the majority, you could say, right, came out against him. Yeah. Who was this uh, that came out against him? We're talking about the uh, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach, who was also a big rabbi. He was actually a little bit after the Chazonish, right? He was younger than the Chazonish. Yeah, he, he probably met the Chazonish sometime, but he was much younger than the Chazonish was. I'm sorry, what was your question? Uh, not exactly, we'll, we'll discuss what it means, right? Not exactly to advocate, but what we're saying is that he certainly thought that there was no Torah prohibition uh, for electricity. This was his claim. As we said last week, right, we spoke about this. But the point is that he wanted to say that the, uh, the Chazonish was, was mistaken regarding this. His, his claim was, right? But it's not building. It's not called building. So the question is why? What's the reason why? So the answer is about time that uh, if you look in the Gemara, what's, what's the source of this, of this, of this, uh, uh, this whole labor? It's in the, in the Masechet Betza, in the Gemara Betza, right? Over there it says, in Lamed Bet, Ladaf Lamed Bet, 32, it says over there that only building which is permanent, the Torah forbade, but not building which is temporary. So what does that mean? That means that if I now, you know, take, uh, let's say, you know, as, as an example, right? This is a classic example. I take a Lego, you know, like Lego blocks, and I build a house with that, right? So the question is, am I now transgressing a Torah law? So the answer is no. Why? Because I'm going to take it apart very soon. I'm going to make something else out of it, right? First I made a house, then I'm going to make a bridge, then I'm going to make a tunnel, then I'm going to make this, I'm going to make that, right? Something strange. Stairs, I'm going to make stairs away, stairway. Each day I do something else with that. This is, this is a permanent building? No, this is temporary building. So temporary building, the Torah didn't uh, for, forbid. That's what it means. So therefore, he wanted to say, because of the fact that it's temporary, there is actually is no prohibition from the Torah uh, regarding building uh, when it comes to electric circuit. Why? Because electric circuit, basically you're turning it on and off all the time. In the morning you want it on, afternoon you want it off, in the evening, then every day it's something else, every hour it's something else, every minute, every day it's always changing, sometimes yes, sometimes no. This is not something really that the Torah forbade, this kind of thing, right? This is just temporary stuff. So therefore, right, uh, what's the rule, by the way? Are you allowed to play with, the, with Lego or the kids, you know? So the truth is that you're allowed to because of that reason, right? There's no prohibition to use Lego on Shabbat because it's only temporary. Playing around, you know, building this, building that, what kind of thing. And it's not really building anyway, it's just a toy. Whatever, anyway. But the point is, right, that uh, regarding the temporary building, the Torah never forbade that. So therefore, says uh, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Oybach, 
that really the Chazanish was mistaken regarding this. And this is also borne out, by the way, in also in other poskim. We have also Rabbi Menashe Klein, right? The Mishneh Halachot also writes in his book. He writes that the majority of the poskim pushed, pushed, pushed off the Chazanish. Didn't, didn't accept that, his claim. Because of this reason that we mentioned. Okay? Same thing applies also for Moreno Rabbeinu, Rabbi Yosef, right? A rabbi, a great rabbi. He also writes in his books, right? Uh, several places, Chazon Ovadia, he writes over there that the Chazonish, his claim that this is called building is not correct. Because of this reason. Same thing, right? So it's brought down in several sources that this is not considered to be building. So what's the problem now? The problem is like this, right? That this, what I'm telling you now, this good news, right? Apparently it's good news, right? For us, whatever. It doesn't go, doesn't go to every place in the world. What does that mean? There are places, in the, especially in the Ashkenazi world, that they take the words of the Chazonish, you know, verbatim, right? They, they don't want to play around that. In other words, if the Chazonish said so, they don't really care who else, who else said so, who else said what. So because of that, many of the, you know, religious Jews, especially the Ashkenazim, they're still until this day worried about the words of the Chazonish that maybe it's called building this thing. And therefore, right, they, they consider it to be a prohibition from the Torah. Electricity. Right? The fact that the Chazonish was pushed off, I don't know, they, wanted, they don't want to hear that. That's too complicated for them. You know, it's a little bit too, too, too involved. They say, ah, but the Chazonish, you know, he was a special rabbi. He's not like everybody else. He was bigger than all the, everybody else. The truth is, by the way, there is some truth to that. But the point is, that, you know, the halakha is always decided by the majority, you know, in most cases. So because of that, for us, you know, who look at things, you know, more in a rational way, we're not so, like, emotional about, you know, the hazonish, you know, making him into some kind of a, you know. He's, he was a great rabbi, but there, there's also, you know, there's also other rabbis. What can you do? You know, I mean, he's, he wasn't the only one. So what I'm trying to tell you is, right, that for for a person who think, who's thinking in halachically in, in the proper way, the truth is, right, that uh, the chazanish already is not relevant here, this, the, these words. Because it was pushed off. What if you live, yeah. in, a, so you live in a building, it's permanent. Ah, what does that mean? I'm sorry. What, what's permanent over there? A building. Yeah. A build an apartment house. Right. It's permanent. So what's permanent? Uh, you're referring to what? Ah, right, right. But we're talking about building it on Shabbat on itself, Shabbat right? Only. That's already built, you know, a long time ago, right? Yeah, it's, it doesn't mean all. We're talking about something that you build on Shabbat. That's what we're talking That's about, right? That's the issue. Whether electricity is allowed to be used on Shabbat, right. it's fine. So, well, if you use a dimmer, then it's, uh, you can leave it on all the time and just use it when you need it. Also valid point. Or with Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay. So anyway, Rabbi the point is that so what are we really left with over here? If we put, take the Chazonish out of the picture, right. Right? with all due respect. So then what's, what's really left? So as we said right last time, that what we really have left is one thing, right? The sparks. That electricity makes sparks. That's, that's the problem. Only if it's unstable. Yeah, but the truth is, you know, that the sparks are made, you know, by the way, I want to explain to you, since you brought this up, I brought it up, you brought it up, whatever it is. We really need, really need to explain, right? What is the reason why sparks come out of electricity? Because there's a conductor that it has impurities in it. Okay. Yeah. The metal okay. Yeah. Let me let me expand on that, right? Let me explain what that means exactly. That uh, what we have is like this, right? Electricity, as we said, is a flow of electrons. Electricity, you know, uh, uh, energy going through the wire, going through some kind of a medium, whatever it is. So the problem is like this, right? Electricity, as we said, electricity is not really fire. Because there's no flame. And there's no, it's not, nothing is really being burnt there. Nothing is being consumed. Yeah. You know, the wire is going to be the same wire that it was yesterday. You're not going to burn that wire, you know, whatever. It's not going to, it's not going to, like, you know, charcoal or wood, when you burn it, that's it, it's gone. You know, that's it. You know, there's, there's nothing to do with that anymore. It's gone. That's, that's a real fire. A fire consumes its fuel. Right? This thing does not consume. Anyway, the point is that electricity, what's the reason why it makes sparks? So the answer is like this over time. That the reason is because like this. When you have that energy flowing through the wire, right? So there's two types of mediums that the electricity can flow through. One is a conductor and one is a resistor. Right? That's, that's the way it is. Okay? So what does that mean? The conductor, what it does is it, it allows the electricity to flow through pretty much like free, freely, 
without interruption, without uh, you know, without holding it back. What the resistor does is it does not allow it to, to go through, so it, it resists. That's why you call it resistor. So what does that mean? That the electricity cannot just flow through it in a, in a free manner, so it gets built up, stuck in one place. And then what happens is, right, as it gets built up more and more, the heat gets built up, more heat, more heat. This can cause a fire, by the way. Why? Because it gets so hot that all of a sudden it comes out of flame. This is the fire that's caused, right? Most, as we said, right, most fires today are caused by electricity, electrical fires. You know, that's what the fire department says. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you. Go, go figure. Now, the thing is like this, right? That you have this uh, current going through. If you resist, it's going to make a fire because it's going to get so hot, it's going to get make a flame. But what happens is like this, right? That sometimes you don't resist really so much. But it, res- it, cannot, it cannot let it flow through freely without any interruption at all. It does resist somewhat. Meaning what? That the current is too strong. Well, it's too strong. Right. So the thing is that once the current gets too strong for the medium that it's flowing through, it starts to make sparks. Because it cannot flow through 100%. It's like a little bit being resisted, a little bit. Even though this thing, this medium that it's flowing through is not a resistor. But since it cannot flow 100%, so that resistance that is being created is what's making those sparks. Because those sparks are really telling you what. I can flow through here, but not 100%. You know, something's holding me back a little bit. It's not 100%. And this is why it makes those sparks. So the question is like this. Now I ask you a question, right? Those sparks, for us, practically speaking, does there, is there any benefit from that for, to us? No. No. Small. We don't get any benefit from those sparks. What does that mean? We only benefit from the energy that flows through the wire. Those sparks go to waste. There's no purpose to them for us. You can't benefit. Exactly. There's no benefit. So why do I tell you this, by the way? The reason I tell you that there's no benefit is because in the Torah, we have also in Halakha, right? When it comes to the laws of Shabbat, we have several rules regarding the laws of Shabbat, which are brought down in Talmud. One of them is that if you get no benefit from that, that thing which is occurring, so it's not really considered to be forbidden from the Torah, because I don't really care what you know those sparks. They don't do anything for me. So what does that mean? When I turn on the electricity, there's several factors going on, right? If I press that button, number one is I don't really want those sparks. They it just—it's a byproduct that comes by the way, you know. I don't, but I don't really want them. So in halacha we call that what? Eno mit kaven. We're not—that's not our intention. To, to make those sparks. So what does that mean? When it's not your intention to make those sparks, you know what that, when it, you know what that does? It brings the, the forbi- it fr- brings the prohibition down to a rabbinical prohibition. It never is from the Torah. Because only from, from the Torah, it's only when you, are, when you want that. But when you don't want those sparks, it's not from the Torah. Let's understand. There's also another concept of the Torah, right? Which is what? That sometimes the truth is, you don't really want that byproduct. The sparks we don't want, as we said. But you know what it is? Sometimes, even though you don't want it, but it's inevitable. You know you know it's going to be, right? There's no way to avoid that. You understand? So therefore, since there's no way to avoid it, we call that in halakha, in Jewish law, psikreshe. What does that mean, psikreshe? You know, the example is like this, right? Let's say, oh, you know, you say like this, right? The person says, oh, you know, I have a chicken. You know what? I'm going to cut off the head of the chicken, but I don't, I don't really want it to die. I just want the head. You know? So we're going to tell you like this. Okay, okay, Mr. Wise Guy, right? You're telling me that you're going to cut off the head. You don't really want it to die, but you know it's inevitable, right? It's not going to live if you cut off the head. Right. So even though you don't really want to kill it, but the fact that you're cutting its head off, it, it, it makes it inevitable. So therefore, right, that makes it anyway forbidden because it's still considered to be right, inevitable byproduct of your action. It's 100% going to happen. There's no chance it's not going to happen. So therefore, things like this, we call that psikreshe, right? But the truth is, right, that there's two opinions regarding this kind of scenario. Is it from the Torah, this scenario, or is it from the, the, the rabbis? Some say it's only from the rabbis, this, this, for, uh, for, this, this prohibition of psikreshe. Some say it's from the Torah. Anyway, the point is over time. Now let's try to, I'm sorry. Logical. Yeah, logical. So let's try to understand. So basically we have here, right, when it comes to electricity, we have those sparks, Okay. Now, we already mentioned last week that the sparks 
the creation of sparks on Shabbat is not really from the Torah, it's, it's a rabbinical. Right? Where do we find that, by the way? We find that in several sources, that there's a Mishnah, right, that talks about this in, uh, in uh, the Gemara Betza. Over there, there's one of the Mefarshim, right? The Rabbi Ovadia Mi Bartanura. He's the uh, main, main uh, commentator on the Mishnayot. So he writes over there, Rabbi Ovadia, that the creation of sparks is only rabbinical in, in nature. It's not from the Torah, creating sparks. So then what is from, what is from the Torah? When you create actual fire. Because a spark is something temporary, you know? Just fly by the wind. It's not something which has any source. Right, it's not really halakhically a fire, right, exactly. From the rabbis only. Sustained. Right, exactly. No sustain, no, 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 sustain. it's not sustained, and it's, there's no fuel. There's no source. The point is, that what does that help you? It helps you like this, right, that now, we know that the sparks that are being created are really only rabbinically problematic. It's not really from the Torah. As we said, sparks are not from the Torah. According to most authorities. And that's how we, that's the halakha, by the way. Where is it brought down? It's brought down in many sources, right? That the sparks only... The rabbinical. It's brought down the Ben Ishchai, brought down Ravadia, Moreno Rabenu. He brings it down also. There's many, several sources also, more, more than that, that they all say sparks are rabbinical only. That's what, that's, that's what we follow. Right? Yes, that's halacha. So therefore, now let's discuss our situation. Now we already said, right, that those sparks are rabbinical. They're not from the Torah. Now, not only that, but I don't really want those sparks. That's not my intention. But it's inevitable, on the other hand. But I don't really care. In other words, I don't get any benefit from it. So therefore, since the original prohibition of sparks is only from the rabbis, and also I don't want it, it brings it down to a further level. Right? Every, every one of these, uh, these caveats, conditions, brings it down more and more. So once you bring it down two or three times, it's already permitted altogether. You understand? That's the whole thing. Each one brings it down one step. Meaning what? That you come down from Torah to rabbis, and then rabbis to permission. That's the way it works. One, each step comes down more and more and more. So what, what does that mean? That the truth is, right, that when it comes to those sparks, really there's no prohibition at all. Why is that? Because the whole prohibition of sparks is from the rabbis, number one. Number two, I don't want it. I don't, that's not, not my intention. And number three, I have no, I have no benefit from it. For all I care, I, I could care less if there was no sparks. I don't want them. The no, there's nothing I, I get from those sparks. The conditions have to be met within that circumstance particularly. To yeah. To be able to fulfill that. Otherwise what does that mean? It mean that it has to be in that particular situation it has to be like that. Yeah, it usually it's like that. That's the way it is. You know, I mean, you know. Huh? You have, walking on the street, you have metal cleats under your shoes. Oh. And you, you strike some metal. Oh. The sparks created on Shabbat. But you're oh. not benefiting from that. So it's rabbinical plus you're not benefiting. So it's yeah, yeah. That's for sure. That's for sure. No question about that. Meet the conditions. Yes, but... Say, oh, I'm going to make this rabbinical, then I'm going to find a way to smooth it over into this level. <laughs> well, the truth is that in our, in our case, I must, I must tell you, right. when it comes to electricity, it's always like this. You know, I don't know of any case where a person wants those sparks, except like maybe one case I can bring you, right? Which is what? We discussed this already. One case would be that you have uh, like the fluorescent lights. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the way the fluorescent lights works is that there's a starter over there. Right, you need those sparks, exactly. The starter is there to make sparks. Right. Why? Why? Because those sparks are what, is what lights up that gas that makes it glow. Right? So therefore, over there, I want those sparks. Or you understand? So uh, apparently, in the case of a fluorescent light, there is definitely a rabbinical prohibition there, because I want the sparks. Apparently, right? We're going to discuss that even further. But when it comes to turning on an air conditioner or a fan... Or you know some kind of appliance like that. There, I don't want those sparks. I could care less if they are there. You know the same thing. Right, 100%. So basically, what we're trying to say, Zarotai, is that those sparks really don't bother us so much. You know, uh, technically speaking. Now I'll tell you also another thing, right? Which is what we already discussed several times in, in, the, in the synagogue here, right? That there's a difference between the types of lights. We have incandescent, the old ones, which are made out of tungsten. We have the fluorescent, we have the LED now came out recently, we have the halogen, all kinds of different types of lights, all, all kinds of things. So what, what, by the way, just to, you know, to a brief overview of what, how these things work, right? We discussed it maybe before, but really the truth is now it's very pertinent to define all these things now. The incandescent, the way it works is that that, that tungsten filament that is being glowing in, in, inside that bulb 
is a resistor, and that's why it's lighting up, because it's not letting electricity go, go through 100%. It's resisting yeah. it. So because of that, the heat gets, gets built up and makes it glow. Right. That's the whole idea. It's a nice invention, you know, nice, nice idea. Good, good mind, you know who made this thing, right? Good, good, good head, good head. So anyway, the point is that, uh, according to halakha, what does it constitute? This glowing tungsten filament that's in there, right? Is this from the Torah or it's from the rabbis? I must tell you that Moren Rabbein or Alvadia, he brings in his book Hazan Alvadia and also in other places, in Yebi Omer also, right? He brings over there that the majority of the, of the authorities hold that the tungsten uh, f- uh, filament, those, those, those ones, incandescents, they are from the Torah, the prohibition. But uh, the question is really, you know, I really thought about this for quite a while, and I must tell you that it's really not so simple at all. I'll, I'll explain to you why. The ones who say that these tungsten filaments are from the Torah, I personally think that there's a, a, uh, there's a specific source in the Talmud which is against them. I'll explain to you what that means. There's a Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, right, in the Tractate Shabbat, over there on Menbet 42. Right? It says over there that if you have a, a, a piece of metal, right, which is on fire, right? Sometimes, by the way, a metal, it's not really something that gets consumed by fire. It gets melted, you know, it melts the fire, it melts the metal. But it doesn't consume it. Unless you use it for a long, 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 long time. So maybe then something will happen. But the point is, right, that when you have a coal, a piece of coal, which is made out of metal, right, some kind of metal, iron, whatever it is, so that metal, you can light it, you can make it like a flame out of it. Yeah. But it's not going to consume the, 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 the metal. You just see the metal just heated up to that point. Yeah, the exactly. So therefore, it says the Gemara over there, that this type of fire, which is basically a, 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 a metal coal, is not from the Torah, it's only rabbinical. You understand? So the truth is, right, that now if you come back to our case of the, uh, uh, the tungsten filament, right, that's exactly the case that we're talking about. That what? You have metal which is glowing, you know, some, somewhat, somewhat of a fire. And by the way, the truth is that the case of the tungsten is even more lenient than the case of the Gemara. I'll explain to you why. Because the case of the Gemara is talking about where there's a real flame there. Over here we don't have the flame. You understand? So it's even less of a problem. It's less of an issue. So what does that mean? That as we said, right, to have a flame, you need to have oxygen. But those tungsten filaments, they have no oxygen in there. There's nothing. There's no air in there. They're tight. You understand? So the truth is that really though that glowing filament which is uh, right in that bulb is certainly not from the Torah. I hate to say it, but that's really the, the truth. So you bring this argument to the... Let me explain to you something interesting, right, regarding this. The truth is that the rabbi himself, I mean, let me tell you something about the rabbi. The rabbi was a very, very smart man, Allah right. Shalom. He was like Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, Moses, the lawgiver, you know, that's what he was. I'm sure that his neshama, his soul was from that place. There's no question about it, right? So, why do I care? I'm not trying to give him compliments now. That's not the issue, right? But tell me, I'll tell you. He was such a smart man. So, so clever, right? What does that mean? The rabbi had, when it comes to electricity, he himself personally ran the whole gamut of all the opinions, right? In other words, every, every opinion that I just told you is presented also in the rabbi. Unbelievable, right? He was able to present every side you know, and everything exists over there. In other words, everybody can find. Everybody can find, his, you know, a way to support his own claim with the rabbi's books. You understand? Everybody will find his own, his own, his neshama, his soul will find. Will be, you can find his soul over there, right? The, the root of his soul, he will find. Whether you sit, whether you think it's allowed, whether you think it's not allowed, whether you think it's rabbinical, whether you think it's from the Torah, you will find everything over there in the rabbi's books. Unbelievable, right? In other words, he was such a genius. Yeah. That everything was, so let me explain to you how that works. This is something unbelievable, right? I must tell you. That the rabbi was such a genius, you know, such a great man, such an unbelievable person. Where do we find this, by the way? So, as I told you, right, last week we, we spoke about this, that he has a response in Yebi Omer, the first volume of Yebi Omer. He talks about microphones on Shabbat, using microphones, right? right? So we discussed this, right, that in the beginning he was very, very stringent about it, and he was very vehement to say that really, maybe you know, from, the Torah, from the Torah, this thing, right, exactly. So then came to him, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Oybach, and informed him that he was kind of like mistaken, whatever, you know, there was a mistake there. He told him, listen, you know, don't go too far, you know, you're going a little bit, 
you, you, you lost yourself over there. You understand? So I told him, listen, you know, the truth is that electricity is not fire. Don't, don't try to make uh, all these things. So what does that mean? In the end, the rabbi accepted that. The words of Rabbi Shlomo And he writes in the end, right, the truth is, okay, I say it's not allowed to use a microphone, but it's certainly not from the Torah. That, that was his conclusion, right? Okay, fine. So that's a nice conclusion. What the, what the, the, the prohibition of using a microphone is rabbinically not allowed. That was his conclusion. But then, right, if you look in a different place, you're going to find something else. If you look in Chazan Ovadia, right, the, the final books that he wrote, you're going to find over there that the rabbi says on top, you know, with the halacha, the t- on the bottom there's explanations, there's, you know, more deep, deeper uh, things there. On the top you're going to find what the rabbi says, that for sure electricity is from the Torah. That's what he says. Wow. So what happened over here? Right? And then if you look in the, on the bottom of those books, right, you have the Omer, you know, the, where it goes into the deeper explanations. And over there, if you really, you know, examine what's been going on over there, and by the way, you have to, to examine what's going on over there, you have to be a little bit more of a chacham, because over there, things are complicated, you know? It's like a big ocean. A person can drown. He doesn't have to swim. He can drown over there, you know what I mean? You have to know how to swim over there. <laughs> Not everybody is able to read these books, by the way. There are many people, by the way, tell me, that those books are so complicated, you know, you'll be on there, the, the books that are like, they say, you know, we start to have, a, we, have a, we have a question, and we go in and to start to read these books, and he says, by, well, by the time we get to the middle of the, of, the, of the response, we already forget what our question was, it gets so complicated over there, you know, we forget already what we're talking about, right? it gets to, you know, so much, this side, that side, this thing, this element, that element, these sources, right, each one of these, uh, each one of these, by the way, the responses has like 400 sources at least, each one, unbelievable, right, and, you know, there's all kinds of nuances here, you know, it's, it's disputes, and this one's saying like this, this one's saying, there's like five different ways of looking at it, this way and that way, it gets like really confusing, you know, so a person can just like say, oh my God, you know, I give up, I, I give up, you know, that's it, you know, this is too complicated for me, give me something more simple, you know, something more... <laughs> that's a different story, by the way. Uh, Marciano, we're talking about Marciano, right, right, Marciano, yeah. So that's a different story. This guy has a different, different issue over there. Anyway, what yeah. Marciano breaking the law all those years? I'll tell you. Um, yes. He definitely has what to rely on regarding the microphone. Right. But there's other things that he did which are more problematic. Yeah. There's other th- other issues there, you know, which are yeah. Uh, there's all kinds of issues there. Though. I don't want to get into it now. That's not the time, right? Uh, you know, no, let's not make this into a no, personal. You know, no, no. Do yeah. you know about the other things that he did? Uh, I'm aware of some things, uh, but I'm not aware of everything. But I must tell you that this rabbi that you're talking about, he is blacklisted in the uh, in, in the in the in the rabbinical world. He's blacklisted. He's blacklisted. Yeah, he's out outcasted. By who? By the chief rabbinate of Israel. They have over there uh, 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 information on him. They do all kinds of strange things. He's, he's definitely out. He's not accepted. He's not. Uh, well, yeah. He he got into trouble. He he he, 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 he swam in deep waters and he, he couldn't couldn't swim. To he got drowned a little bit. You know, got a little bit too deep into the waters. He got a little bit. Too <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. And he's, uh, he's, it's a whole discussion, right? This, uh, he's still alive, yeah. He's, he's sick, but he's, he's ill, but he's still alive. He must be old. He's an old man, yes. Anyway, the point is, getting back to what we're saying, this is a this discussion, David. We have the, that's a different discussion. That's, one, that's, a, that's a car discussion, you know, in the car, you know, when you're going to Mercedes, you know, whatever, 650, whatever it is. Okay, so anyway, the point, <laughs> okay. So that's a discussion that you discuss in the car. Anyway, what time? Yes. We're getting back to our... Uh, right? For that discussion, you need, six, you need 650 horsepower for that discussion. So I always knew Marciano as someone who meant well. It's a discussion. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a total... It's a, it's, a big, it's, a, it's a long story, David. Yeah, he took us in yeah. when the Georgians didn't have a place to go. It's not so simple, not so simple. No, he, the truth is that he has some good qualities too. That's no question about that. Right. He's, a, he's, you know, he's, a very, he's a very benevolent person. Yeah. So, he's a Jew. I mean, you know, he's a, he comes from a good roots, you know. Uh, somebody's outcast uh, or blacklisted, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's a wicked person. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's wicked. He's wicked. Just because he has positive qualities, he'll benefit in this world. Uh, yeah, well, what can I tell you, you know? It's, it's not what you think. Or 
wait a second. Are you making a judgment that he's wicked? No, because according to the law of God, he's wicked. Okay, you know, guys, we can talk about this in the car. You know, yeah, let him take us out to the, you know, a point lookout. You know, whatever over there. And the, so we need to discuss in the car. The reality is the reality. God bless you. You know, no, I, I see what you're saying. Believe me, I, I see both sides. I see everything. Everything is clear. Wow. It's a long discussion. And by the way, I personally, uh, no, we need we need him also. We need him also. Uh, I, but but we, I, I personally, uh, you know, I, I can tell you also that I don't have all the information as well. There's things that I don't know, uh, the issues that you know. Right. I really don't have the whole. I don't really know the whole story. And anyway, the point is, about getting back to what we're saying, it may be worse than you think. But that's what I'm trying to tell you, right? There's all kinds of things there which are, you know. Let's not get into it. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a long discussion, David. Getting back to what we're saying about Thai. It's a, it's, a, it's a very electric discussion. It's a very a lot of electric, electricity there. As you, it can give you a big shock. <laughs> okay, so I guess it was relevant that you brought it up. But <laughs> anyway, the point is about Thai. Getting back to what we're saying. If you look in those places, in the rabbi's books, you know, in that, those deep waters where the oceans start to get very deep, a person can drown over there. If you really know what you're, what you're, what you're, what you're reading, you can see over there that it's, it's allowed altogether to electricity. There's no, there's no prohibition at all. As I told you, why? Because all the things I explained to you, right? Sparks, this, your intention, no intention. He, he, he talks about, where did, I, where did I learn all these things from? From him I learned then these things. Why do you think I got it from? From the sky. We have a, we have a, you know, we had Baruch Hashem. We had a great rabbi like that. We got everything from him. You know, most of our Torah comes from him. Is, That's uh, why, uh, uh, yeah, but especially the ones that we learn with him, you know, we learn by him. That's something else. Is he the one that talks about the electric shavers also, by the way? Sure, he talks about that, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. Yes, he does, he does. He permits it, by the way, yeah. Permits. Yeah, permits it, yeah. Anyway, about Ty. Yes, I'm sorry, yeah, no, no problem, no problem. Looking more on the lenient side. You know, so yes. By the way, I want to tell you, if you brought this up, Nisi, I have to tell you, a good, a good chidush, right. a good novel idea. You know what I saw in the Zohar Kadosh? This was yesterday. By the way, I was just learning, you know, right, right. I, have a, I learned Zohar. So I saw an amazing concept regarding this, which blew me out of the water. It blew me away. I'm telling you, I got blown out. I made a marker on that. I said, I cannot lose this place in the Zohar. You know, something amazing out of this world. So what, what did I see? And this, by the way, is very pertinent to Halakha. It has to do with the core of what Halakha is, Jewish law. Something amazing, the Zohar Kadosh says. The whole world has to know this, by the way, because I never heard this from any rabbi. I saw it myself, you know. But the truth is that we already saw something similar to it in the Talmud. I'll explain to you, really, you know, you should know that the Zohar and the Talmud, there's no dispute between them. It's just two different ways of looking at something sometimes, you know. It's all one Torah. It's all one unit. You have to know that. You have to understand that. So now we're going to explain to you, by the way, how that works. I'll give you a very good example of that. Really, the Talmud and the Zohar is one. Why? Because there's a famous Talmud, there's a famous Gemara, in Masechet Betzah also, right? We're learning a lot of sources from there. It says over there in the first, first chapter, Masechet right? Betzah, an interesting concept in Halakha, Jewish law, which is what? Kocha de hetera adif. You know what that means? That the strength of the permission is better. Meaning what? That it's, it's better to give permission than to be, to be stringent. It's better to be lenient. That's what it says in the Gemara. Right. So you don't have melancholy. You understand? So, what does that mean? I mean, what? Oh, I, I should always give you permission for everything, you know? I should be like your sugar daddy, you know? Give you always, you know, candies. <laughs> As a, oh, what am I? What am I? Uh, candy, handing out candies? Handing out licorice to people? What am I doing? Is that a job of a rabbi to be like that? No. So, what is it talking about the Talmud? What is, what is it, what is it talking about? By the way, this concept was always stressed to us by the rabbi, Al-Vadiya. He told us, Koha de hetera adif! You know how many times we heard from this mouth? From this, this, a hundred times at least, I heard. If not a thousand. The lenient opinion is better. So, what does that mean? What's, what's going on over here, right? So, uh, it says, by the way, in the Rashi over there, Rashi explains on the Gemara. What does that mean? He says that when two rabbis have a dispute, right? One rabbi says it's allowed to do this. One rabbi says it's not allowed. So, says Rashi, what does it mean that the one that's lenient is better? It's, 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 it's superior. So, he says it means that we learn more from him than, than we learn from the one who's being stringent. Mm -hmm. more There's more to learn. What does that mean? Amazing thing Rashi says, right? Ideas like this. Says Rashi that the one who's being stringent, why is he being stringent and the other rabbi is being lenient? Because the one who's being stringent is not really sure if there's permission to do this. He has doubts about it, you know? 
He's not clear, it doesn't have clarity in his head. In fear. Exactly. So that, 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 the fact that he's not clear is what makes him stringent, because he's, he's afraid to give a, 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 a permission. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't want to take it on his shoulders to get, tell you something which he's not allowed to do. He has doubts about it. You know, these rabbis are very honest people. They have a lot of integrity, you know what I mean? So, he's afraid. But the one who's giving you permission, why is he doing that? Because he knows for sure that it's allowed. You understand? For him, it's, there's no doubts. Well, he, did, he doesn't want people to suffer. <laughs> no, that's not the issue. Because if you got to suffer, you got to suffer, you know? If there's nothing you can do. I mean, if it's not allowed, it's not allowed. you got to suffer. You know what I mean? So we're not talking here about now, you know, having like per, mercies on a person's, you know, emotions or whatever, something like that. That's not the issue here. The issue here is that when a rabbi tells you, I know that this is permitted, that means that he's for sure, he knows it for sure. So his opinion is superior to the opinion that says that what well, uh, I, I don't I, I cannot permit you why because I'm not really sure if it's if it's permitted or not. He's being honest with you, you know. It's honesty. So Rashi says that what. So what are you really learning from the one who's permitting permitting? You're learning from him that for sure this is correct. But the one who has doubts, what are you learning from him? Right? What the, he's cloudy. He's got a cloudy head. There's nothing to learn from that, right? It's not a virtue to be cloudy in the head. There's no virtue like that. You understand? So it says Rashi, that's the reason why the, permit, the permissibility is more, is more superior than the, than the forbid, for, 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 for forbidding. Amazing idea, right? This concept, right? The rabbi told us this over, over and over, a thousand times. He, he brainwashed us with this thing, you know what I mean? Brain, it was a brainwash, basically. Excuse the expression. And by the way, he told us one time when we were in his house, he used to invite us to his house to give us a personal lecture, you know, to the students. So we would go there and he would give us advice, you know, how to formulate the halakha, how to paskan halakha. This was what we were learning over there. We're not learning over there to, uh, you know, to, uh, to give, to be, to be, to be a puppet rabbi. We're learning to, to, to paskan halachot. That's, that was the whole idea over there. So uh, the rabbi told us like, like this. This was advice, you know, dagwariga, you know, dagwariga, you know. He gave, he gave us advice. He said, "My sons, my students, I must tell you one thing." He said, "That this generation is not the, not the, like the generation of the Benishchai. The Benishchai was, you know, from the generation before, hundred years ago, hundred fifty years ago. He was a big rabbi in Iraq in Babel, in Baghdad, and he had a tendency to be very stringent. You know, this rabbi. He was very stringent on the community." So he said, in this generation, the rabbi told us, we cannot be like that. It's just not relevant to the generation. Why? Because the generation is very weak. They're not able to handle the stress. And that's what you were talking about, right? So here it is pertinent. What you said, it's definitely pertinent over here. You understand? So, but it has, it has a condition, though. Right? It has a caveat. I have to understand what that means. What does that mean? That the rabbi told us, because of the generation being very weak, he says, in this generation, you have to permit them to do as much as possible. In other words, you've got to go to stretch out the permission as far as it goes, you know, all the way. Is that why we have gay parades? Stretch it out. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes us weak. Need I look? Need I look? Let me explain to you. Let me explain to you what that means. So the rabbi said, right, you've got to stretch it out as much as possible. If this is not the generation of British high. If you tell them to be stringent, they're going to be angry at you. They're going to hate you, the community. They're going to say, this rabbi, you know, always telling us, this is not allowed, this is not allowed, this is not, we cannot handle it, it's too much for us, you know. What, what is this, you know? You're making the burden too heavy on us. Cut it out. That's what they're going to tell you, the people, in this generation. Or, if they're not so honest, they're going to tell you, you know what? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah, okay. But really, in their home, they're not going to do like what you say. They're not going to listen to you, you know, because you're being too, you're being too heavy on them. The burden is too heavy. That's what he told us. Amazing rabbi, you know? He was Moshe Rabbeinu, this man. Unbelievable. So what he told us was like this, right? He said that, but as one, there's one condition, which, you know, we have to understand this because this is very crucial. Right. If you don't understand this condition, you're taking this principle in the wrong way. Right? What does that mean? You become like a reform rabbi, you know? God forbid, you know? Yeah. Become like a, you know? Well, in a way, it sounds like he was reformed. Good. Now, I'll explain to you what that means, right? What does that mean? So the, the, you, I'm now I'm going to tell you why that's not the case, right? There's no, there's no reform going on over here. Why is that? Because what he was trying to tell us is like this, right? That there is a, in, in halakha, in Jewish law, there's a structure, there's a system, there are rules. 
how to derive, how to formulate, how to come up with a conclusion. And this is the, the essence of what being a rabbi is about, to understand how to do that. That's what it means, right? Production. If you just read books, you know, uh, we talked about this right before, right, an hour ago. If you just read books, and you know, like, you know, you, you know what it means, and the, okay, uh, this book I know, this book I know, but you don't know what to do with that information. You don't know how to, how to handle that. You don't know how to make, come up with a conclusion. You don't know how to use that information to come up with a logical conclusion. You know what you're considered to be? What, the, what do rabbis call you? They call you rabbi? No. You know what they call you? Hamor no sesfarim. You know what that means? You're a donkey that carries books on your, on your shoulders. Because you're a donkey. Why? Because you don't know what to do with these books. Yeah, you read them, but you don't know how to, how to use the information. Right? And this is what makes the difference between a real rabbi and a fake rabbi. Fake news. You understand? Fake rabbi is somebody who knows how to read. He'll tell you, oh yeah, this is what it means. Yeah. But he doesn't know what to do with that information. A person like that, and by the way, this, this hinges on one thing you should know. This, what, the real rabbi and a fake rabbi. You know what it hinges on? One thing, more than anything else. Having a, having a tradition. Having a masorat. You have somebody who taught you how to do these things. If you don't have somebody who taught you, and you sat with people who don't know how to do it themselves, how are you going to become a rabbi yourself? You know, the only way you can get this is to get a tradition from somebody who knows how to do it. That's the only way to do it. And that's why, you know, they say, right, the Chazal say, the Red Sages, they say that you should be golet to makom Torah, right? It says in Pirkei Avot. What does that mean? Go to exile and go to a place where they really know how to learn Torah properly. Don't stay in your neighborhood, you know, Regal Park, and expect over here to become a big rabbi, you know. Go to a place where there's a big rabbi there and go to him and learn from him. What do you expect? What do you think? You're going to learn over here, sit over here, and, you know, and you're going to learn, see these, uh, these uh, lightweight rabbis over here, you know, who don't know black from white and you know, pink from, from, from brown. They don't know anything, these people. So they, they're going to teach you how to, how to pass in Allah. Huh? They, they themselves don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it themselves. So you don't want us to come to you anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they're just the opposite, right? Because I was Zohar, Baruch Hashem, to be 15 years with the rabbi, you came to the right address. I must tell you, you know, I don't mean to be arrogant. You know, there's no arrogant, right? That's the only thing. That's the only difference between, yeah. It's up to the rabbi to to interpret. Yeah, they're the ones who who, who decide the halacha. They're the ones who Everybody decide the halacha. Everybody is going to interpret it the same way. Exactly. That's why we have we have we have disputes. Yeah, that's exactly that's the point. The right? There's always going to be disputes until Mashiach comes. So there's nothing you can do about it. But when he comes, it's going to be absolute. Absolutely, there's going to be votes, like we said, right? They're going to take votes, like it was before. They're going to vote. They're going to make a court. They're going to vote. And it's going to be the majority. It's going to be the halacha. The point is, what I came back with what we said, is that um, we said, right, that the rabbi had this uncanny ability to bring down all the sides of the halacha. So we have to now reconcile, right? Why in one place the rabbi says electricity is rabbinically forbidden from the rabbis? One place he says it's from the Torah. And in another place, it seems to be like it's, it's an all altogether. <laughs> You know, three different places, three different sources. What's going on over here? So the, the answer is like this over time. You want me to explain to you the greatness of the rabbi? How his judgment was so, you know, right. He had like a, a, amazing judgment and amazing oh, uncanny ability to weigh everything, you know, the proper way. So when he tells you that it's from the Torah, in places like that where he says, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the incandescent lights, as we said, right? Those incandescent lights, according to most of the poskim, according to most of the, most of the authorities, it's really from the Torah. But as we said, right, there's also a different way to look at it. That it's not from the Torah. As we, we already mentioned this, right? Now let me tell you, the rabbi himself, by the way, brings this down as well. Even though on the top he says that these incandescent lights are from the Torah, on the bottom he says they're not from the Torah. What does that mean? There's also a different way to see it. What's the way to see it? Says the rabbi that the truth is, right, that we can say in general, about all electricity, every electric uh, contraption, every electric appliance, every electric thing that we use, that none of the things are from the Torah. You know why is that? Because there's a different reason. Besides the fact that we mentioned that the, those sparks, you don't want them. You're not interested in those sparks. You have no, 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 there's no need for those sparks. They just go to waste. They're a byproduct. They're a waste product, those sparks. So then what, what really, what's, what's really the issue? So says the rabbi, there's also another thing there. Which is what? That there is a way to say electricity really is all uh, indirect causation. Rama, that's called, right, in Halakha. The Gemara says, right, in Masechet Shabbat, that melacha, labor is forbidden, but grama is, for, is permitted. Right. Like moving a table over the grass. Now, what does that mean? 
What is, what is the co indirect causation over here with electricity? The truth is right, that when you press that switch, it's right away. There's no delay there. right? So you cannot say that there's a delay. There is no delay. It's happening right away. Split second. Chuck. So then how can, Usually right, when we use the concept of grammar, indirect causation, that means that there's a delay involved. When there's a delay, let's say 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 5 seconds, whatever it is, so that can say, right, that says that what? That this thing is not, uh, um, you're not doing your labor, you're doing, a, you're doing indirect causation, which is permitted according to the Torah. Even according to the rabbis, by the way, it's permitted. Right. Grama. But here over here, it's actually not, not, there's no delay. So then what are we talking about here? So the rabbi brings over here an interesting concept, which is brought down in several authorities, that they say that the concept of electricity is all indirect causation, it's all grammar. You know why? Not because there's a delay. There's a different reason why. You know why? Because when you open the switch to get the current going, you're not, you're not the one who's pushing the electricity through. You're just opening up a path for it to go through. It's going through by itself. You understand? All you do is give it a path. You're opening the road. You know, like let's say you have a, let's say, you know, they have a, right, the LIE, right? There was an accident on the LIE, God forbid, right? And they closed it down. So now people were stuck, and they opened back up, right, and let, let you go through. So what do the police do when the police open up the road, the LIE, right, when there's an like accident? Are they the ones who are moving your car? No, you're moving the car. They just give, they're letting you pathway. They're giving you a pathway to move. So the same thing with electricity. That what? That when you open up the electric switch, you're not really moving electricity yourself. What you're doing is just giving it a pathway to go. That electricity goes by itself. What does that mean? That in the you know, electric plant where they make electricity, they're the ones that are making electricity flow. It's not you. You're just opening up the path for it to go. So therefore, you're not really doing anything. That's an interesting idea, right? So this is called Groma. Right? Yeah. So all this time, <laughs> women have been suffering, carrying baby <laughs> carriages up to the 20th floor. <laughs> Now, wait, don't think it's so simply now, because I must tell you, right, that even though, as I told you, wait, we, have to, we still have a long discussion, David. I must tell you, it's, the discussion is quite long. But the truth is that, you're, in, in principle, you're right. There, is, there are solutions for this. There are solutions. There are solutions for these issues. Yeah, but I'm saying, how do you use the elevator? That's the question, right? How do you, how do you, how do you use it? Ah, yeah, but who pushes the button? How do you push the button? That's the question, right? That's, that's all. You do it the normal, normal way, the abnormal way, you do it with, with a goy, with a, with a Jew, there's different, different things there. You can push it yourself, it's not work. So we're going to, we're going to talk about that. But the truth is that David, that what you're saying, I cannot tell you that you're saying the wrong thing, but we still have a lot more to discuss. discuss right? I'm not going to stop using the elevator. <laughs> Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that you're uh, so. You know. Uh, okay. So, uh, but I'll, t I'll tell you something interesting, right? If you want to know the rabbi personally, right? How was he personally regarding electricity? Here we say, right, that what that in his books he wrote all kinds of sides, right? This side, that side, all kinds of issues. The rabbi was a very God-fearing man, and he had, you know, one of his great principles in halacha was. You know what it was? Something really amazing. But this showed, by the way, his, uh, his humility. He lived long enough to see uh, electricity uh, implemented, right? Sure, 93 years old. He was 93 years old, yeah. He's alive? No, he, he passed away three years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what happened was like this, right? That um, interesting thing is... <laughs> so interesting thing is like this, right? That the rabbi himself... As we said, he brought down all the, you know, the sides of electricity, all the issues... He himself, personally, was very scared of using it on, on Shabbat. Well, because he came from Benish High generation? I don't think that's the reason. The reason was is because he felt that a person on his, on his level, somebody who was on that, oh. on that level, you know, should be stringent about this. And also, I think that he personally had also some kind of a doubt regarding it. That maybe what? That there is a side to say, maybe there is one side to say, you know, even though it's not really halakha, but the Khumra, you know, as a stringency to say that really it's called fire, electricity. There is some such a... So therefore what? I can tell you personally, right? What was his, his behavior regarding electricity? You want to know? How did he personally behave? I'll tell you. Just the opposite of what we just said, right? He personally, 
there's a, you know, there's a, this is an interesting story, right? That one. That we, you know, from the yeshiva that we were learning in, his yeshiva, his son's yeshiva, once in a while they used to take us on a vacation, you know? We used to go to a hotel in the summer, you know, take, take a rest, go to the north, you know, take a relax, chill, chill out, you know? Whatever. So we, we all used to go, and we used to bring also our families, you know, the, the wives, the children, and this, everything, whoever was married. Most people were married over there. So this is not a kiddie yeshiva, you know, this is a grown-up yeshiva. Yeah, the whole kolo, you know. So uh, what happened was that the rabbi himself also would come sometimes to those, to those gatherings to, to give us uh, over there a uh, lecture, you know, to be with us over there. It was really nice, you know, it was very special stuff. Very special, these things were very special, to, you know, to be with the rabbi like that. <laughs> So, you know, just two things I remember from those days. There's two things, right? Which is what? Number one is that if, he would, if we would go to a hotel, right? And he would come with us to those vacations, you know what would happen, right? He would never take the elevator on Shabbat. Even though it was an automatic elevator, which runs by itself on Shabbat, they have automatic function. That's how it is in Israel, right? In Israel, they have automatic elevators, Shabbos elevators, right? Shabbat elevators, that they run by themselves. It's automatic. You take those? Why not? You know, if you need it, you need it. But the rabbi himself, right, never took those elevators. So meaning what? Even though it was automatic, and even though, right, it's really, uh, he himself wrote in his books that it's allowed to take those elevators. Right. He himself wrote that it's allowed. But he himself would not take them. He was very, he was very stringent about that. Who was it? Was the rabbi's rabbi? He had several rabbis, several, several people they learned from, right? But really the truth is that he surpassed all of them. Meaning what, that he, you know, he just started out with those rabbis, but he himself went much further, uh, you know, uh, than, than they went. They, were, they went. Whatever, interesting. That's, you, it's, you, it's a rare case where the rabbi becomes bigger than the, you know, the, the, the student becomes bigger, bigger than the rabbi, right? It usually doesn't happen like that. That's not usually the case. In this case, that's the way it was. Anyway, the point is, Rabbi his main rabbi was Rabbi, rabbi Azratiya, you know, who was very big. He was very big Kamal Chacham. So what happened was like this, right? Number one, he never took the elevator, even the automatic ones. Number two, also in his house, he was so scared about electricity, he didn't open the refrigerator himself. Never opened it. He had somebody else do it, you know? Somebody else, kid, this, that, whatever. He himself never opened the fridge. Can you imagine such a thing like this? He was such a God-fearing man. He was a very God-fearing man. You know? On the one hand, he told you you're allowed to do it. You can open the fridge. You can take the elevator. But he himself never did it. He would have no issue doing it in front of him. Huh? Somebody in front of him, you had no issue with that. Yeah, sure. He allowed it. He wrote that it's allowed to do these things. So he, do it he himself didn't do it. If I know yeah. that stealing is wrong, yeah. and it is wrong, yeah. it's not even debatable, and I decided that it's wrong, I would never do it. But it's okay with me if I have somebody else steal for me. <laughs> I'm not comparing stealing to putting on a switch. Right, 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 right. So he wouldn't do it because he was... A, he was on such a high level, he yeah. was a, so God fearing, but he had somebody else do it. Yes, because he, the kid, you know, the kid can do it. That's not a problem, right? The kid is not really ob obligated in mitzvot anyway, right? The child, you know, whatever. The point is, the family, the family that he, he was living with, you know, his family members, they all did it. Yeah. He was the only one that didn't do it. Right. Regarding the fridge, I'm talking about, right? The, fr the fridge. So turning, on, so turning on the electricity. Yeah. What's the difference between turning on electricity and passing the flame from, from the gas stove? Because there's no flame there. That's the, that's the difference, right? That's number one. That's the, that's the issue that we're talking about. There's no flame in electricity. Huh? The flame from the, from the stove is on all the time. If you have a pilot light, yeah. If, if you have some, some, some have a pilot light, some don't have a pilot light. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, but I just want to point out, nowadays usually they don't have a pilot light. It's like electric starter, you know? There's a third. Yeah. If you're low yeah. Gear, you got Aren't there yeah. levels on Shabbat? Yeah. Where it's worse to break something else than, you know, uh, disobey another uh, rule, uh, rule. Yeah, there's all kinds of levels, obviously, right? There are cer certain things on Shabbat that a person does them, he's liable to death, liable to stoning, right? There are, there are things, you know, there, there's all kinds of levels. We don't stone people. Anymore. We don't stone people, but what happens is like this, right? They say the Chazal, that even though we don't stone them, but he may get into a car accident and die because he, he broke Shabbat. And this is the same thing, you understand? In other words, they judge him from Shemaim like, you know, like, like we're gonna, we, we cannot do now, but they judge him. They do. They're not, they're not, they don't refrain from that. 
A lot of people have car accidents, you know, they don't realize, you know, the, because they're driving on Shabbat. They have a car accident, they died. They, they don't know why, what's the reason. They don't realize that that's the reason why they died. That's the, they, don't, they don't realize all the things. Anyway, Yorotai, there's, we still have more to discuss about this, right? But I want to tell you, yeah, I want to tell you one thing. That the rabbi himself also, right, as we said, all these things he didn't do. So he was very, very stringent on when it comes to those things. So, what, what does that mean? That means that the halacha is not like that. Like what the rabbi did. We can open the fridge on Shabbat. There are ways to also use the elevator, if, especially if it's automatic, right? There's also ways to use the elevator when it's not automatic. We're going to discuss that next time. The, the practical uh, applications of all these things. But what I want to tell you is, right, that there, as we see, right, there's several ways of looking at electricity. One way is to say that really it's from the Torah. Some, some say like that. Some say it's from the rabbis, electricity. Some say it's altogether permitted. So we have three different approaches regarding electricity. I think so, the yeah. Amish use the electricity now. <laughs> right? They did it before. I think they come God bless them. I don't know what they're doing, but uh, you know they're not following the Torah. You know, so whatever. I mean, I, you you know. Consi- I always consider yeah. the Amish yeah. uh, the Christian Hasidics <laughs> for some reason. Yeah. Okay, whatever. Yeah. They have deal. Yeah, they have deal. You know. Right. So anyway, the point is, I would tie. They're, they're, they're good people, those people. They're good people. Yeah. God bless them. They're good people. Anyway, the point is that, uh, Rabbi we still have more to discuss, but you understand now, right, that we have several ways of approaching the issue of electricity. Next time, what I want to discuss is more the practical elements of this. You know what I mean? The practical, what to do, practically speaking, and why, and so forth and so on. So, Baruch Adonai Thanks for coming. God bless you. Next time, we'll pick it up.